Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you may be. Hello, my name is Jermaine McDougall, and well, um, I'm coming to you today live from Bogota, Colombia. That's right in South America, a bit far on the other side of the world, but it's all good. Uh, for starters, I would love to thank the, the, the event organizers uh, for allowing me to, to be here and participate as well as interact with each and every one of you. Uh, hope all is well on your end, but like I said again, uh, we're going to spend the next, I don't know, 20, 30 minutes. Um, I'm going to be sharing you some ideas about creating a path for what we call CLEO teacher identity in that particular instance. Uh, just to get started, some introductions. Um, this presentation, for the most part, is going to highlight, I should say, some possible what we call taxonomies that I have already put together, as well as related to skills and competences for that desired effective clear teaching in that particular instance. Some of the things that we're going to talk about today in this particular presentation corresponds to what is NES, uh, and a look at competences as well. As we're going to look briefly at identities, and I'm going to give you some ideas about some of the frameworks that I have already looked at and possibilities of a new framework that I'm trying to put together and related to bi or multilingual competences for that particular instance. Okay. In addition to that, uh, what can I say? Well, why am I motivated about this particular presentation or why am I motivated about these particular topics? Well, there are lots of things that are going on nowadays and some of the things that are going on, as you can see here within Colombia, Latin America and the South American region is that it is still a big deal related to what we call nest teachers and non nest teachers. OK, uh, there is not enough information that I found or even that exists so far related to what students and teachers believe about these particular concepts. OK, and in addition to that, there's still lots of what we call misconceptions around the idea of what is native like in that particular instance. Unfortunately, uh, there's still lots of discourses that are constructed around, I should say, recruitment policies. OK, and the focus is particular on the native speaker. So the idea is that this particular study that I'm going to be sharing with you today corresponds to um, unrevealing some of those myths that exist related to what we call um, uh, native speaking teachers uh, as related to CLEO content and language integrated, I should say, competences for that ideal practitioner inside the classroom. OK, uh, what can I tell you? Give you some ideas about uh, three different groups of teachers so that we can under have a better understanding about where I'm talking about. Uh, first of all, I'm looking at what we call relabeling teachers, relabeling teachers, because uh, for years now we have had names. Um, we've had labels put to us in terms of language professionals, language teaching, etc. And over the last 30 years, these names have somehow, I should say, changed uh, briefly or they've been adjusted. But either way, they still exist nowadays. So as you can see, um, going back, native English speaking teachers, we can date them back more than 30 years ago. Um, although there's a lot of debate, academic debate and discussion related to these types of activities, uh, it is still around. OK, uh, what can I say? Nest, fairly well established term for the most part. But we also talk about ideas like expatriate teachers, overseas teachers, or some people recently say native English teachers in that particular instance. But my question is where, how can we define that native English teacher? OK, traditionally, these native English teachers, per se, they come from the inner circle. OK, state uh, uh, nations like the US, Canada, the UK, Australia and, Australia and that particular instance. But we also have what we say two uh, types of teachers. And these group two teachers, once again, these are teachers who are often what we call fluent in the language of their students, all right? And perhaps sharing it also as a first language. So once again, we still have those things that we got to talk about. Uh, we also looking at teachers from what we call the inner circles as well. And so we have the inner circle teachers, uh, such as countries like Nigeria, India, and the West Indies. But also we have what we call languages, where we have nations that still have English as what we call an official language, okay, uh, for both the children, they're schooled in businesses, etc., and once again becoming much more bilingual and more often multilingual in the entire process. So to give you some ideas about the three different influences that we have, or not really influences, but the three different groups of teachers that we could actually consider or even think about when we are talking about native English speaking teachers. But the idea that the storage is not stopped there. Okay. The story is not stopped there. Why? Because, well, there's so many other things we've got going on. And we also need to consider the following. Uh, do all of these teachers, for example, yeah, do they have the skills in order to successfully, what we call, as you say, coordinate content, yeah, and language successfully? Can they do both of these at the same time? Is it okay for them? Do they have the skills? Do, do my language professionals actually uh, teach, that actually teach math, do they have the skills to teach math? 
And what about my math teachers that are actually teaching in English as a, as a medium of instruction? Do they also have all the skills needed in terms of second language acquisition or even first language acquisition? Do they have any clue about those types of things? So that's what we're going to be looking at. And this is what, once again, the motivation study here, since I am representing or, or thinking about um, the research that's been done here in Latin America, okay, I'm going to be reporting on what takes place in Latin America. Does not mean that what I am sharing, what I'm talking about today, uh, is not taking place in your teaching context as, as per se. Um, I would love to see maybe in the future we can connect, organize, and see what are, what are the thoughts, beliefs, and perceptions related to, I should say, that native English speaking teacher in your region. OK, because I show I am sure um, there are some other difficulties, challenges, and there are some really interesting debates that are going on. But this is the, the challenge that I have here. And this is the debate that I would like to bring to the table. Uh, for starters, we talk about what? Uh, defining, I should say, native like competence. Uh, it's very difficult still for people to be able to define what is a native uh, English speaker or I should say what is native like competence okay native like competence is one thing all right so once again trying to define that concept in a, in a previous study has has not been i should say uh easy to come by i would also say that educational systems all right uh not understanding what language is or how language works uh language is, is a very interesting uh phenomenon and it's a very interesting um how we as language professionals we, once again, were well-versed, linguists were well-versed in terms of how the language is used at work, but the educational system, they seem to do not. Why? Because language is still an isolated item. Language is still treated and looked upon as it is something different. It's like it's weird. It's all by itself in a corner. Okay. I can also say that still we don't have clear frameworks on what we call competences for CLEAL or content and language combination inside the classrooms. These are still things that we're working on. These are things that we have to somehow figure out what can we do? Because since CLEAL is very much so context oriented, meaning that what? We should be able to um, have, I should say competences that cater to the region here, okay? The same like it would be, for example, in, in, in Korea, or the same could be, for example, maybe in Kuwait. The same should also be able to take place in Canada, the US. And even then, so we would have, I should say, much more specific, I should say, context and challenges inside our classrooms, okay? Uh, what else can we talk about? I talking about some of the other regions, talking about lack of understanding and skills, okay? In terms of the competences, skills needed for that bi or multilingual teacher. What I have found so far is that there are lots of, I should say, um, requirements, their skills, or even possibly some competences out there, but they're all isolated. Uh, there's no one, I should say, there was no one framework or structure that I found that I came across related to, I should say, the dimensions that correspond to both bilingual as well as multilingual teachers, okay? And in addition to that, uh, once again, belief, which is also still sad, that native-like competences are needed in order to be successful inside uh, the, the, the classroom as well as for language learners. Something that once again, we have to consider, something that we have to uh, keep in mind, but the idea is that these are things that are still existing nowadays, which is why all of this becomes a problem within Latin and within the Latin American region in that particular instance, okay? And last but not least, we also talk about the stakeholders, okay? The stakeholders in terms of what? Native English speaker is needed, all right? Uh, or required in order for success to take place inside the classroom. This is by far the largest myth, the largest, I should say, un unfortunate um, debate that's going on because many language institutions, universities, schools, uh, they still have this mindset. And this mindset is what has caused the language profession, uh, education as a whole, to once again uh, continue to be divided in that particular instance. So these are some of the things as to why I am motivated, still I am motivated, as to um, sharing these ideas. What can we talk about? What did I do in terms of method? There were quite a few things were done, just to give you some background information before I actually jump into the rest of our presentation for today. But we talked about what? I uh, checked with students and teachers in terms of what they believed about NES and non NES. Okay? Uh, we also talked about the beliefs surrounding the concept of native speaker models. Okay? Um, I also, once again, tried to define core competences and skills needed for what we call qualified teachers. Difference here is not bilingual, 
not multilingual, not native, but I'm looking for qualified teachers, qualified practitioners inside the classroom. That's what I was trying to, to, to define. In addition to that, I checked with over 200 plus teachers who had already received CLIL training, okay, and that are teaching in CLIL-like or CLIL-oriented environments, okay? Very important that we talk about here because I am looking for targeting uh, individuals or participants that actually know about what's going on, that are immersed in, I should say, bilingual or multilingual environments here in Latin America, but at the same token, uh, they have also received training, per se. So it's just not one or the other, but, you know, we're focusing on those areas so we have a better target. Well, as you know, this is a mixed method approach in that particular instance, using descriptive research to, to measure the quality of the teachers, well as the teacher competences, population, uh, once again, university EFL students mainly, CLIL trainees, bilingual education stakeholders. For now, we only looked at the university students, okay? Uh, as time progresses, we will be focusing on, I should say, um, the other grade levels as well, educational levels, so that we have a better understanding about what's taking place, okay? And at the same time, we also talked about teachers in both undergraduate as well as graduate programs uh, and English language professionals and bilingual teachers uh, per se. So as you can see, we had a, a, a quite a quite interesting mix in that particular instance and in order to get some things done. Well, as you can see, there's some of the things we're doing, we have been doing so far uh, in order to actually get the data that's already been collected and have a better understanding about what's going on in that particular instance. What else can we say? Um, as you can see, just to, just to kind of elaborate a bit more, we talked about undergraduate uh, level students for pre-service pre teachers. Uh, we looked at undergraduate level, I mean graduate level, sorry about that, uh, students and in, in, in the um, graduate level students and the uh, in-service teachers from Universidad de Solana. We uh, actually have two master's degrees in English language teaching, one for autonomous learning environments, the other one for what we call self-directed learning. One is both, one is 100% um, a face-to-face, -face, traditional on-campus blended learning mix, and the other one is delivered 100% online. Uh, we also talked about in-service language teachers as well, in-service language teachers as well, uh, from, the diff from other institutions and other universities, both public and private, in order to get a better understanding about uh, their thoughts and feelings. Uh, so far, like I said again, we talked about more than 200 teachers, more than 100 teachers, I should say, in, in the sense that uh, more than 100 teachers um, in teaching clear like or multi bilingual like environments. And we also have quite a few what we call, I should say, um, stakeholders related to bilingual school administrators, coordinators, directors, principals, or, and even psychologists, which is quite interesting because they also play a large role in the selection process of teachers coming on board. And it's really good to know what they think or feel related to what we're doing. Okay, give you some ideas about some, some, some things that we have done so far. Give you some ideas as to where the data came from and how we're going to, to look at it today. Analyze and explore more than 20 plus, I should say, frameworks related to combining content and language today. Uh, many of those frameworks can be found in what we call Europe, Canada, and, and, and the US. And none of the frameworks thus far have been, I should say, related to what we call Latin American context or regions or even environments. Some Latin American institutions I have found that they have partially adapted, adopted, um, I should say, some of those foreign frameworks. When you adapt some of these frameworks, well, it's a start, but it, it's, it's not the end all. The idea is that we need, we should continuously look for frameworks and models that correspond the, to unique, I should say, teaching environments and things of that nature in order to have better success, which is the idea. Very few frameworks consider, I should say, multilingualism or competences for teachers. Uh, and far too many, once again, uh, trying to come up with ideal competences that are, I should say, far away from the actual realities of the, of the classrooms and the teaching context and things of that nature. Right. Now, uh, since we're talking both about competences and skills, I think I thought it would be interesting for you just as a reminder to get some, some, some differences to understand uh, what is a knowledge, what is knowledge, and how, how does knowledge, skills, and abilities, okay, so how does knowledge, I should say skills, all right, and abilities, they actually make up what we call a competence, okay? They make up what we call the competence here. And in addition to that, we are once again familiarized with what skill is. As you can see, the skills, actually, they actually, they form part of, form part of what we call this particular competence. Lots of times you will see both of these concepts either separate, together, or even mixed, because lots of times there's a fine line between one and the other, but the goal is that we are clear as to 
A competence corresponds to knowledge, skills, and abilities, and a skill is only just one of those things that we have there in that particular instance. Okay. Uh, this is what I came across in terms of the overall competences that were, were discovered as a result. Uh, lots of good information. Uh, some of the information is repeated. Some of it is repeated, but uses a different name. The title is the same, but I found lots of things that the descriptors were, once again, very similar in nature. So I did my best to kind of group most of the like items together so that we can actually have a better conversation as to what exists nowadays, because it's, 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 uh, before I can move on and, and try to fix the wheel, trying to, I should say, establish, create a gap there, try to fill that gap that we have, because there is a gap in terms of having competences that are competences and skills that are desired for, I should say, CLEAL practitioners inside the classroom. Uh, and once again, CLEAL is context oriented, so every context is a bit different. Uh, my South American, Latin American context in terms of challenges may be different. I, I'm sure it is from the, the Asian context in that particular you know, uh, manner. So these are things that we need to think about. Talked about what? Teaching in general. So there's a teacher, okay, as the individual. Core competences for teaching, teaching, okay, this is the teaching and learning process. And then there's some other, they talked about professional competences as well for teaching as a whole, all right? And then we have 21st century competences and 21st century skills and competences. As you can see, once again, there's a lot of information on these two. I decided to separate them so that you can see that there are some slight differences about what we're looking for as the individual and what the individual should possess in terms of characteristics and things of that nature. They are a bit different, I found. Uh, and we'll talk about bilingual instructional competences. Bilingual instructional competences. There you go. Now, this is coming closer closer to what we want or what we're what I'm looking for but once again it's not complete and then we talk about language teacher competences and we look at content teacher competences different uh, the idea once again is just to share some ideas about what I found and my proposal as to where, where, where we could head in that particular direction so for starters I'm going to talk about some of the competences that make up a teacher competences for that teacher as you can see, based on literature and lots of other studies in the field, four key competences have been identified. Yeah? These competences, they correspond to trying to make the teaching learning process much more innovative, to helping the teacher to become much more innovative and proactive and creative inside the classroom. Okay? So we talk about things like learning competences, uh, educational competences, talk about social competences, and definitely we need technological competences. So these are just some ideas in terms of the core competences that I should say the average teacher needs to have when they decide to become a teacher. When you have received that vocation, when you are ready to start that journey, these are some of the basic things that, you know, once again, scholars, the literature has proven time and time again that are needed. Once again, um, doesn't correspond to bilingual, doesn't correspond to content and language, and as you can see, definitely there are nothing, nothing related to multicultural anything here. Okay. Another one, this is related to what teaching per se, teaching the process, the teaching process. Okay. Now the other one, the previous slide was what corresponding to the teacher. This is what we're talking about in terms of teaching. What do I need, and what what tools do I need to make this successful? So here, this is interesting because we talk about pedagogical. I should say skills, tools, and competences, personal, social, as well as professional. This is used to do what? To improve, I should say, our students' performance. Used to improve the student's performance. Now, in addition to that, think about what? Uh, think about your, your educational toolkit, okay? Uh, your little toolbox. And I come into the classroom with my toolbox. And as a result of my toolbox, I have a job at hand, you know? And my job is to deliver X or J or why to my particular students. Uh, what am I going to do? I'm going to look inside my toolbox, okay? And I'm going to try to determine what is the best, uh, what is the best tool strategy that I need in order to be successful in the classroom. That's what I'm talking about here in terms of the pedagogy, trying to improve my students' performance, okay? Now, in that particular instance, I'm going to look at each one of these, and we're going to take a few minutes, and I'm going to briefly talk about pedagogy, personal, social, and professional, so we have a better understanding about what teaching competences uh, are involved in that particular incident. For example, uh, pedagogical competences, principles, techniques, and strategies that the teacher chooses. I choose, 
this is my toolbox I figure out what I want to get done okay what do I need communicative competences social cultural competences there you go action research competence is very good being observant uh, looking at data being able to make informed decisions all right and competence related to information management big data what am I doing what can I do with the information that I have very important so once again pedagogical competences are needed to help out with the teaching process what else I got personal competences look at this one well personal traits attitudes and beliefs of the teacher three large areas knowledge of myself self-esteem yeah you would you would you would be surprised at how many uh, language professionals colleagues that still have issues with self-esteem and control beliefs which is another key area that we need to once again focus on and figure out what's going on social competences which is my third area related to teaching related to teaching all right refers to what how to manage social and emotional development inside the class there you go interesting because when I talk about that effective filter that effective filter has a lot to do with social and emotional uh, issues inside the classroom self-management relationship management social awareness as well as responsible decision making now when I look at these four elements what am I thinking about well uh, this is what I'm hoping that my students should be able to do in the classroom but guess what this is designed for the teacher is a teacher self-regulated is a teacher able to self-manage themselves okay relationship management this is very important social awareness these are social competences once again that often we do not have as, as professionals okay inside the classroom regardless of the the, 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 the class we are teaching uh, and these are this is a very important area you're going to see in a few minutes as to um, what others believe in that in this particular arena here and the last one corresponds to what professional competences yeah this is what I am doing as a teacher to maximize my ability to improve my students' learning outcomes. This is what I do, okay? Challenges and obligations. How prepared am I? Jermaine McDougal, okay? Subject knowledge. Do I know anything about English, math, science, social studies? Okay, what do I know? The knowledge of my learners. Do I know what my learners need? Not what they want, but what do they need? And now what I want them to have. What do they need? Teaching methodologies and approaches. Am I up to par on what's going on related to the latest trends? Okay, in teaching math, in teaching science, in teaching English per se. Okay, current uh, curriculum knowledge. What do I know about my institutional curriculum? How is that compared to international trends in curriculums and things of that nature? Okay, and knowledge of the environment. Very important. What do I know about my institution? What do I know about the classes that I'm going to be teaching? I just arrived to the country. I just arrived to the city. What do I know about my environment? So these are things that once again, am I prepared for these challenges and obligations when I'm teaching? Okay, so as you can see here, these four areas here are uh, very important, but I have another question. Which one of these competences do you think the learners prefer most? What do you think they like the best? Huh? Any ideas? Do I have a show of hands over here, anybody? Yeah, well, I'm gonna give you some ideas, all right? So personal competence, professional, social, and in that particular instance, pedagogical interesting personal as you can see personal competences was what the learners thus far they found to be the most popular can you imagine personal and followed by professional after that social and last but not least pedagogical competences interesting the study interesting what I'm finding why because I see lots of information out there and what I'm seeing is that our students learners they are a bit more they're they're they're, they're human they're they're I should assume human oriented but they're also affected nowadays uh, by that human element okay who am I as an individual and who I am is also going to represent and reflect what I do inside my classrooms definitely and lots of times we, we, we fail to mention that or we fail to even realize that these types of things actually cross over inside the classroom so knowledge of myself self-esteem and control beliefs are what most of my students or the people that have been I said tasked thus far as being the most important element now these are students what about if I talk about my my colleagues my colleagues obviously they would say something totally different I need to have what information related to what I need to have information related to something totally different okay in that particular instance so give you some ideas in that particular instance so interesting the information that we've got so far interesting the data that has been collected thus far and now you know I'm gonna move on to a few other areas okay so characteristics of that 21st century teacher facilitate inspire be creative 
Okay, that's what we're looking for. Maximize what? The potential in their formal as well as informal learning experiences. I like this one here because we talk about a, a learning experiences. Yeah, uh, not what I am only giving them in the classroom, but what I can do for them, what they're doing for themselves, which is far more important as well. So our students, they bring lots of experience to the classroom. How man or women enough am I, professional and mature enough, to actually include that inside my classes? Am I ready to do that? Can I do it? Because you will find that lots of teachers are actually, you know, blocking out that own personal experiences that our, our students bring to the classroom. And as a result, you know, limiting, I should say, the potential benefits and successes that we could have in that particular arena. All right. And here, I told you at the beginning that they are similar nature, 21st century competences. Uh, and so we're a bit similar and also the teaching skills. So we talk about things like knowledge of civil literacy, global awareness, cross-cultural skills, okay? We also should consider things like critical and inventive thinking, okay? Uh, and communication, collaboration, and information skills. These are all key areas that, once again, we should be thinking about. And in terms of our teaching skills, teaching skills, I think I find this area quite interesting because once again, we are pushing these types of things on our students. We're pushing our students to move in this direction. But guess what? I am still finding out that teachers, in terms of competences, they lack critical thinking, lack problem solving, reasoning, and we're talking about synthesizing information. I'm still finding it in my but colleagues that have been around for a very long time, they're still having difficulties trying to evaluate information, summarize information or even paraphrase for that matter so if i'm talking about synthesizing can you imagine way up there on the food the thinking food chain we still have lots to get done so these are things that we need to consider these are things that are really interesting for us but once again i have yet to find a framework that incorporates all of these different elements it would be great to have them all but once again uh we need to see what's the best route to take so that we can incorporate these things when we are trying to find the ideal practitioner inside the classroom okay we also talk about what uh, research skills we talked about creativity curiosity imagination just once again that that creative thinking and we talked about once again self-direction that self uh, stuff so as you can see lots of things have um, in, in terms of the 21st century teaching skills I've already discussed it a few minutes ago in terms of the competences that are needed for that teacher so as you can see some of these things they kind of cross over and and so that's a good thing all right that's a good thing so we don't have a shopping list of you know hmm, dozens or even hundreds of items that we would love to see in the classroom that's not a night that's not the idea so what's next what's next okay based on what i've seen based on what you i have just showed you what's next because we're trying to get some ideas about what that bilingual or multilingual practitioner all right now i'm using the word teacher but I know we use words like instructor, um, there's a professor, there is, uh, the, and so there are many other uh, words, uh, or I should say that can describe or label what we do in the classroom. But for practical purposes, I'm going to focus only on the word teacher, using also practitioners, uh, et cetera, et cetera. All right. So what do we need? That bilingual individual or multilingual individual in the classroom. What do we need? Language proficiency. I can, I can just not, you know, pretend that you know language proficiency is not going to be there attitude you know attitude will go a long way and as you can see uh we talked about a few minutes ago the students are looking for related to actually things that are related to personal competences personal competences also relate directly to attitude what what, what am i able to do what i what can i do but what do i want to do and am i willing to do okay content knowledge as well as a good one linguistic knowledge cultural knowledge and last but not least we talk about teaching knowledge these are one two three four five six key areas okay that we could consider think about or even once again uh incorporate in our classes thinking about the the ideal by or multilingual professional teacher practitioner inside the classroom okay this is uh something that i came across and i wanted to share with you because i said before I have looked at many different tables, many different frameworks. This is one that came across in terms of uh, what we call towards a common European framework of reference for language teachers. Everything here is great. I love it. But guess what? We're only focusing on what? The language teacher. The goal here is not just only the language teacher. What about my math teacher, my science teacher, my social studies teacher? What about the marketing teacher, my psychology teacher? What about my medical teachers, my doctors? What are we doing? The lawyers. 
The goal here is to establish a framework that can be used across the board, okay, across the board in a particular instance, that I can use it regardless of the subject that I am teaching, but uh, I need certain skills, okay, skill sets, uh, not the ones that I only bring, but the ones that I also need to acquire. And as, as a teacher training manual or as a teacher trainer per se, uh, I, I can figure out what gap my teachers have, what gap, you know, they're going here, they're going here, they're going here, so that I can actually help them to get where they need to be. There's no one individual is going to come straight from their undergraduate program, the university, and start classes tomorrow, and they have all of this. No, but if we build, we start from the bottom, pre-service teachers, okay? We, we instill these types of things, and we, we, we bring it over to where, uh, when they get into the teaching practices, going from pre-service to in-service teachers, and we start to realize and identify that there are gaps that are needed, or they're not needed, I'm sorry, that the gaps that exist in the program, guess what? You change it. We, we figure out what's going on, and we can build on what they already bring to the classrooms, what they already bring to the teaching fields, okay? So, shifting now, because I told you the last topic, uh, we're going about dealing with what? Teacher identity. What am I going to do with teacher identity? And, and what is teacher identity, okay? So, what's your teacher identity? Question for you. Uh, in that particular instance, a question for you, but we're going to figure out what that teacher identity is, okay? And when we talk about teacher identity, there are several things that we can consider, okay? What sets you apart, okay? What makes you recognizable? Eh? And how do you brand yourself? By skills, sub-skills, okay? As well as personal characteristics. For example, I am a university professor focusing on uh, research as well as bilingualism and, 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 and teaching methods and, and methodologies and approaches, etc. I am a preschool teacher. I am an elementary uh, social studies teacher. I am a, um, and we can move on. So who are you? What is your teaching identity? When I came across the question about what is your teaching identity, there were several assumptions, okay? Common assumptions that I came across. And these common assumptions, I don't know if they're good or bad, but lots of things I came across. And in addition to that, when I was asking the question about identity, I received lots of intel, information related to what? Gender. Um, gender is one thing, identity is another. And there are many contexts where the two kind of go and coincide, where they work together, which is fine. But for the purposes of this particular study, I was getting an idea about who you were or are as an individual, and how does that relate to your teaching identity in the classroom, okay? Understanding about who we are, because if we don't know who we are, it's going to be very difficult for anyone to label us, you see? Label us. And so the idea is to figure out who we are. And so it was interesting that the data that I received thus far, uh, it kind of pointed in the, in the area of what? Uh, gender bias. And that's not the idea. Gender's great. Uh, there are lots of studies related to gender, but I'm looking at gender, not gender, but I'm looking at identity as the individual and the teacher. So what did I come across? Came across a couple assumptions, all right? All teachers develop a view of what a good teacher does or what a good teacher is, okay? We all, we can read in Facebook, we can look in social media, we can look at, you know, the thousands of blogs that exist that talk about a good teacher, a good online teacher, a good math teacher, a good science teacher, a good preschool teacher. So we, we have an idea of the stereotype that exists about what a good teacher can do. We also look at the roles that they play and the practices that they are actually doing. So common assumptions. We can also talk about the good teacher identity is a desirable one, okay? Because still we have a long way to go. It's desirable. And what I'm trying to establish here is trying to establish an ideal, a desirable, I should say, desirable competences and skills that can actually help out with the teaching and learning process in that particular instance, okay? And related to what? Bi and multilingual classes. However, I also get some assumptions related to teacher identity because, as you know, we're looking at multilingual. So I came up with a bilingual teacher being able to speak two languages. Okay, bi, that's what it means. Okay. And I also got a bilingual teacher is a native speaker. Okay. Well, I got a question mark there because my question mark here is quite interesting. Okay. Is it that's what the teacher identity is? But once again, as you can see, this is what the mindset that lots of people have already established and that's what they are thinking. Another one, a bilingual teacher can teach anything. Yeah. Well, I know we are heroes. And in this particular time and day, we are doing much more than we were, uh, I should say, initially um, set out to do. Okay. We are heroes. Okay. We can do a lot of things. But are we superheroes in the sense that we can do anything? 
Yeah. So a common assumption in terms of teacher identity. All right. And these two right here, they, 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 they pose a question because why? These are these are things that once again we talk about, we discuss, and they're often, I should say, um, or should I say, they are often looked at as the um, not the ideal, but the average practitioner in the classroom, bilingual, a native speaker, and they can pretty much do almost anything in the class. Not the idea, but once again, some common assumptions that take place. So shifting a bit more and just talking about what is that identity role, okay? um it's developed what through social social interaction okay with role partners and resources okay uh and we have what we call role relevant norms and, and expectations i just showed you a few minutes ago we talked about what some common assumptions the good teacher good teaching practices okay the ideal teacher the best way to do certain things so once again we have role models okay but then we also have what we call some influences all right, influences on the, um, the practitioner uh, role identity formation, okay? So that's that practice, practicing teacher's role, okay? Past histories as learners, very important. Reflecting on where I came from, how I learned, and how that has actually become a part of my own teaching model, my own teaching model. Teacher education programs, of course. They are very successful teacher education programs, and they are but not so successful teacher education programs. We have to be honest, they exist, okay? And classroom-based experiences. So as you can see, these are three key areas that help me, Jermaine McDougall, to identify who I am as a language professional. What identity do I have, okay? And once again, we talk about even within a particular rule, identity is differentiated. Of course, we are all different. And I am not saying that we all have to be the same way. We are all labeled and relabeled time and time again. The goal here is that we understand and appreciate who we are, okay? And once again, the curricular role identity, dimensions of the curricular role as associated to what we're doing in that particular instance, okay, in that particular instance. So as you can see here, lots of things going on here, lots of things that we need to understand, but at the same token, identity uh, is really focused on, what well, once again, what? A, the, I should say the environment, the context in which we are in, social interactions, and a lot of it comes from here. A lot of it comes from here, okay? Past histories as learners. I just did an exercise here a couple days ago in one of my one of my sessions with my, my graduate students, and we were, we were talking about a needs analysis for the CLIO context, needs analysis for the classroom. And one of the exercises that we did was what was quite interesting. I walked them down memory lane, where we had an opportunity to talk about who am I, who was I as a learner? acquiring English or acquiring Spanish, depending on their, their, their first language. And it was interesting to see. And then I had them to compare and contrast how they actually learned the role models that they had with what they are doing now as practicing teachers. And they, once again, trying to establish that identity, they start to realize that they had positive influences on their teaching practices and they have several negative influences nowadays on their teaching practices, okay? So, with that in mind, we talk about teacher knowledge according to how it's learned. Uh, trying to winding down in terms of identity, we talk about knowing about, knowing how, and knowing to. Okay, this is a two right here in the corner. You probably can't see it. Apologize. Knowing to. Okay, so knowing to. So, knowing about. I need to know about the subject as we talked about. I need to know how it's learned. I need to know about my school and institution and university in which I'm working. I definitely need to know about my students. And I need to know about strategies for continuing to develop as a teacher. This is me in terms of what? Creating, establishing that identity that I so need. Okay? All right? And then I'm going to move on to my next one. Because my next one talks about what? Knowing how. And when I talk about knowing how, I need to know how to support learners through planning and teaching. I need to know how to notice what's happening in my classrooms. That's where all those research skills that's being observant comes into play. I also need to know how to provide classroom conditions that support my learning. If I, if I know about my classroom, if I know what they need and I can put it together, I know how to make some informed decisions. I need to, uh, I need to know how to what? Assess learning. I need to be able to what? Relate to learners, colleagues, as well as parents. How am I doing that? Do I know how to do that as a teacher? All again, once again, a part of my identi identity, all right? And I need to be able to access, access, as well as use new ideas. Don't be afraid to try new things. But once again, as teachers, I'll be ready for those types of things. 
can we do those things? Is that part of my identity? Is that part of the things that I'm going on? And last but not least, talking about two, I need to know what? To be able to use what? The knowing about and knowing how, the right place in the right time, making that match, the perfect matrix coming together, knowing when and how to do certain things. And I need to know to be skilled at noticing aspects of the classroom environment. I also need to be able to what? Interpret what's noticed, use it so I can with what? Inform decisions on what to do next, what to do next, see? In teaching, this is a process, it's cyclical. It's, it's, it's going constant over and over and over and over again. So we really need to know how to do lots of, lots of things in order to once again, help me be connected to be identified with my identity in that particular instance. So last but not least, we talk about what? These are the competences that we would need to develop. Teacher education curriculum, considering these types of things, okay? Design to be able to learn through, noticing, observing, once again, laying the foundation and be able to once again, tell, read and see what's going on inside our classrooms, okay? Got you so far. So as you can see, before I move on to my next item and my last part of the, our session for today, because we're pretty much, we're coming to an end, I promise you we would look at a couple of some competences. I promise you look at some of the competences that I have already identified. And I've looked at, I put them in a, a couple of charts so you can see them really briefly all in the same spot. So we have a better understanding about what I just talked about previously, how each and every one of those elements, they make up, uh, I should say, what we would like to see in terms of competences for the ideal practitioner inside a content and language integrated learning classroom. Okay? So these are so many ideas, competences that I have already looked at, established, and I have tried to regroup based on lots of the information that I found. One group talks about teacher competences in general, okay? So as you can see here, it, it pretty much leaves out lots of things. Cognition, communication, learning to learn, competences, social, initiative, creativity, personal. Now, you're going to find that lots of these competences are repeated. You are going to find that lots of these competences uh, are, are repeated or duplicated. Why? Because uh, the idea is we're looking at what so, one of the, some of the models exist, group A's, the group A's, when I say the group A, uh, what is a group A? A group A consists of several other frameworks that I have looked at. And what I did was group them together and where they were only focusing on teacher competences. Okay. So I tried to group them all in one. Area. Group B corresponds to my proposal, Jermaine S. McDougall. So this is my proposal per se, group B. And we'll talk about that here in a few minutes. And basically I, I was looking to do what? Put cognition communication related to second language acquisition as well as first language acquisition, okay? Methodology and assessment, I've grouped together. CLEAL, bilingual education policies, but they also looked at intercultural competences as well as personal competences. So this is what Jermaine is thinking in that particular instance, okay? Trying to group everything together, only focusing on one, two, three, four, five, six large areas. Actually, what I initially had, there are 11, and I had 11, there are 11 or 12, areas and I broke them all down so we can only focus on five to six key areas. Okay. Uh, here's another one just looking more towards a CLEAL approach. Okay. So CLEAL program competences, CLEAL and bilingual education, target language competence for teaching, course development, supporting language, uh, learning, etc. So this is another group in that particular instance. Another group that we came up with DEF. Okay. Uh, talks about what? Uh, setting to the motion. So I've got what we call integration, implementation. This is more about implementation here. Okay. Looking at Clio from an implementation set and what students, what teachers need in order to be successful for the implementation process. So only on implementation. All right. Here it's talking about uh, making a transition. Okay. Between what you're doing now as a, as a language professional, as a content professional, and see how much of that is connected or related to CLIO. Nowadays, a more CLIO oriented uh, concept. So as you can see here, this is all about the four language skills, but at the same token, looking at the average teacher. Are you, this is, you know, trying to, to fit the gap in that particular instance. Bilingual educators. So these are the ones that proclaim to already be working in a bilingual environment. And as you can see here, they're talking about first, what's the first thing on the list? Language proficiency. Can you speak the language? Are you bilingual? 
Okay, are you uh, a native speaker? What are you doing? And we talked about attitudes, content knowledge, because mainly here I'm looking at the science teachers, the math teachers, the chemistry teachers, the biology teachers. Okay, linguistic knowledge. What do you know about the language in order to be able to teach it accordingly? Cultural knowledge and teaching skills at the end of the day. Okay, but here the focus is mainly on language proficiency. And last but not least, another group that we came up with corresponding to target professional competences, targeting professional competences. So personal, clear fundamentals, content and language awareness, methodology and assessment once again. And as you can see here, building learner capacity, cooperating, uh, deploying strategies, lots of activities here. I kind of grouped them all in one chunk of information, research and evaluation, learning resources, environments, classroom management, and last but not least, clear management. So as you can see here, I, I've been able to group lots of these areas together um, and, and still working to figure out what would be the ideal, the ideal. But in order to, con order to conclude, in order to close up our session for today, uh, what can I tell you? What can I say? Some closing remarks and some, some ideas, some food for thought, if you want to call it like that. Uh, teachers, in terms of bio multilingual, uh, identity needs to be addressed more often because I am finding that um, what I have found thus far is that we don't have a clear understanding about what identity is so it needs to be addressed more often uh, competences also need to be developed in what the initial teacher training phases okay because still we're having difficulties there because they are going to the field they're going to i should say um they're they're going to classrooms and they're still missing so much more so the idea is to try to make a connection without how we are working with universities in terms of undergraduate programs and how schools universities that are in actually the teaching mode how are we connecting the dots how are we trying to help out so that they can produce the elements that to produce the type of teachers that we need okay in the field competences skills matrix are needed definitely to be defined and redefined here within my latin american context my invitation is to you as well in asia and wherever you may be to also look and see what do you have nowadays in your closet as to competences, skills, or matrix in terms of that ideal practitioner inside the class dealing with both bi or multilingual environments, okay? What else can I say? Linguistic, linguistic imperialism is still very visible, very visible, sad but true. We are in the year 2020, but once again, uh, it is still there. Uh, so we need to figure out a, studies like this one can help us to once again uh, get the word out so people are, are well aware of what's going on. Okay, uh, many believe this still the non the native speaker are superior to the non native speakers. Sad, but once again the data is still you know reeling out to tell be the same thing. Uh, what else can I tell you? The only acceptable variety of of, of English English is what one used by native speakers. That is false, but once again still it's out there. Uh, what about the uh, the Colombian Englishes? What about the Peruvian English? What about the Mexican English? Okay, or the Brazilian English? What about the Korean English, the Japanese English? Okay, what about the Saudi American English? What about the French English? The list goes on. We need to start to be able to understand the different varieties of Englishes that exist nowadays. Okay, uh, and every native speaker has a better mastery of the, the English language than not native speakers. Once again, false. In that particular instance, false. So we need to consider those types of things as well. Okay. And once again, the attitudes towards emulating native speaker models still valid. I want to be like, you know, this one. I want to be like the American speaker. I want to be like the British speaker. I want to be like this. I want to speak like this guy or this gal. Not the idea. Okay. I need to speak like myself. Performing, understanding, and once again, uh, communicating effectively in that particular language. So to finish, conclude, what are we going to do looking ahead? What do we have looking ahead? It's going to take a generation or more for the mindsets to change. It does not going to happen overnight. I just said we've been working on this now for more than 30 years, uh, at least labeling what we call um, native English speakers, you know, expatriate speakers. Uh, we're, we've been working on this for a very long time now, so we're trying to figure out what's the best route to take. Okay, uh, more research is needed, I should say, in Latin America regarding that ideal teacher. Okay, that ideal teacher in that particular instance. 
But we also consider, for example, we also need to increase what? Uh, the studies to include more stakeholders, parents, administrators, making them much more aware. So I'm in the process of trying to figure out how can I get them on board as well to participate so we can better define and, and, and understand what's going on. What else can I say? Widen the study. Well, I'm looking to widen the study throughout Latin America. I started with Colombia, and the idea is can, to branch out into Mexico, Peru, not Peru, Peru, uh, Ecuador, Chile, uh, as well as Brazil in that particular instance. Promote what we call intercultural awareness of English at all levels of education at all levels of education because once again those Englishes that exist that you use that I use that we are accustomed to using they are start still not um, incorporated into our classrooms just yet okay and the mindset cannot be changed overnight but if we start now to appreciate I understand our role definitely we can make a difference a difference can be made okay so once again uh, my name is Jeremy Dougal here are a few uh, selected references that I use to, to, to help put this presentation together, okay? Um, have the information out there. Hopefully, it could be useful to you about what's going on, where you are in your context, and how you can start to also make a difference. Um, I would love to stay in touch with you. I would love to stay in touch with you. And once again, you know, I, I would once again thank you for allowing me to be here. I spent uh, uh, maybe an extra 10 or 15 minutes more than I had initially thought I would. But I think it's interesting. Uh, the information is valid. The information is key. And from Universidad de la Sabana, uh, I would like to once again um, uh, thank you for allowing us to be here. But also, you know, uh, you know, a nice warm shout out from South America. Thank you so much. Look forward to connecting with each and every one of you. And have a great day and have an awesome conference. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.